So I'm a bit late. Um, this week um, on our Insta Live, we're talking to um, Emma Flint uh, about uh, from Emma's nutrition, all about uh, menopause and cardiovascular disease. So I will just let her in. Um, once I have Emma's nutrition. Here we go. Here we go. Hello. <laughs> I'm such a technophobe. I was, this afternoon I've been talking to someone all about our, our tech stack and everything at Field Doctor and I can't accept an invite to, to let you join. So apologies for that. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice Not a problem. You. It's good to see you. Yeah. It's good to see you on screen. It's funny. We were talking earlier and, uh, and of course I haven't seen your face and I've seen your face on social media and stuff, but it's funny to see someone live and in, like in real time. It's really good actually. Yeah. It's got my back <laughs> my eyes and everything. Um, well, welcome Emma. Um, so I'll introduce you a little bit, um, although you'll probably do a better job than me, but, um, you're a chef turned nutritionist. Um, you worked um, for a while at the Newsom's Health Clinic, um, working alongside the menopause doctors there. Um, but now you've set up your own clinic um, and really focus on um, looking at helping women um, with specific nutritional um, issues around digestive and hormones, but also particularly with women experiencing perimenopause and menopause uh, and how they can, I guess, create some balance and and in their lives so we yeah we'd be lovely to hear a bit more about you and um because i think the focus today we really want to talk about menopause awareness day which is wednesday um yeah. but the focus is on cardiovascular disease so um but maybe yeah. you want to give us an intro first and that'll yeah no uh, absolutely Thanks, Alex. You're absolutely right. I work as a clinical nutritionist and I see women. I focus, my area of focus is absolutely perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause. That that time in a woman's life where everything can be thrown up in the air and where it lands down is, gosh, anyone's guess unless that person is a bit more proactive. So this is my area of focus in my nutrition clinic. Absolutely. And I was a chef. And so I do have an enormous love of food and nutrition. Um, and to, together with my nutrition degree, it's just fantastic, actually. Uh, it goes together really well. So I love also um, sharing information. You know, I know you're passionate about food tasting great as well as its nutritional value. So, you know, it's it's a really good here. So, uh, yeah, I am thinking very much this month about in particular for me, every month is World Menopause Awareness Month. But yes, this week is World Menopause Awareness Day on Wednesday. And so I think that this is actually a really good chance to highlight cardiovascular health. And that's what the International Menopause Society wants us to focus on this year. Because in fact, when a woman goes into menopause, her cardiovascular disease risk goes up and it actually becomes the leading cause of death for her post-menopause so that's ahead of all cause of cancer everything it becomes the leading cause of death and that's because of that loss of estrogen which is really cardiovascular protective and so that's why and it, and even if the uh, person is on hrt with that hormone replacement therapy absolutely it does support her cardiovascular health definitely but even so it's not going to support her like her own estrogen would have done prior to menopause and so it's such an important time to focus in on this. And I know we were talking about health earlier and, and a kind of like our shared passion for health and things like that and what can be done and, and how in fact cardiovascular health tar tally or ties in so much with other health aspects. But um, yeah, let, we'll focus in on that definitely. Yeah. And in, and in terms of, so I'm a man, so this is not something I will experience, but uh, 100% is something that I've learned more about in the last, well, ever since Davina's program, I think it's sort of <laughs> suddenly become in, in my uh, area of sphere of knowledge, I guess. But um, can you talk a bit more about 
about what symptoms people should look out for because there are definitely people on here that won't be uh won't be of an well, won't be experiencing perimenopause or menopause but may well but there'll be others that that might have some symptoms and be good to outline yeah what those are and um you know, what people should look out for and what and then you know not what to do when it happens but or, or actually what to think about when it happens and yeah. um yeah yeah that, absolutely alex would be happy to the thing, interesting thing is roughly apparently at the moment, 51% of the UK population is female and any woman who lives long enough will go into menopause. At what age? That actually is really variable. Commonly, the menopause officially, the, you know, percentage wise, most women will go into menopause around 51, but actually there's, there's a massive of, uh, variation. And there's surgical menopause, there's other reasons for going into menopause, there's premature ovarian sufficiency, which is a term go, when the person goes into menopause prior to age 40. And that is actually surprisingly a lot more common in the UK than people think. So what, what are the symptoms? So it begins in perimenopause and perimenopause simply means that time before menopause. Mm. And typically that can be any time, actually any time in the 10 years leading up to a woman's actual menopause. And so, but for, typically for a woman, she may not maybe notice symptoms, maybe perhaps five years out from her menopause. And what symptoms will she get? She might get disturbed sleep where she might've been a good sleeper previously. And she might find she needs to wee at night where she might have not needed to or, or wee quite a few times at night she might find she's a little bit more tired she's a bit more anxious she might find that her bowels actually and her gut gets a little bit kind of more out of balance uh, she might find she starts to begin to put a little bit of weight on she might also find that she is um you know, you know, the hot flashes or the hot flushes that we typically think of as menopause, that is one of the symptoms. But in fact, there are 20, 30 symptoms. It might be dry skin or dry mouth. Um, in fact, skin can become really itchy and things like that. And it's very odd. And that, and a person's period could get become slightly disturbed where, say she had kind of a perfect every four week period, she may have a delay in that or even skip a month or two or periods become more frequent. Sometimes they become lighter, sometimes they become really a lot heavier. Sometimes it's where a woman hasn't had it before she gets what's termed as flooding, which is really heavy periods. So it's so variable, but it's the change that, that a woman needs to look out for. And the problem at this age, generally, typically, maybe a person in their 40s, they are thinking often it's a really busy time in their life. Let's say they've got kids and they've got a partner, it's stressful and they've got L aging parents and it's just like, Ooh, you know, and they're working part time, full time, you know, like it's a time in their life where they think they're being pulled in all directions and they push it down to that and they don't realize that actually this is their change in hormones, quite natural, mm. but then they might not address it. And, you know, they're looking low mood comes along and they think that it's just because perhaps they're not getting along with their partner or their kids are just absolute shit you know real rap bands and it's just like yeah life but actually there is a lot that they can do and it's I from my perspective there's a lot they can do with nutrition but of course there's a lot they can do with lifestyle and then if they want to or need it they can absolutely go on HRT so there's so much and it's really really good um, but we'll focus here on nutrition. Uh, there's actually loads of uh, science-backed articles about lifestyle choices, apart from just trying to get a really good night's sleep, but absolutely things like literally like no yoga and doing more exercise really helps with symptoms. But let's focus in on nutrition. Can I, before yeah. we do that, and this is, um, I'm going to ask a question that I don't know the answer to, but um, if someone's on contraception and, and more likely it's a, the female rather than the male, but both can, uh, both can. I guess does that impact the symptoms, um, or do they just present a different way? Or because I guess the contraceptive, whatever it is, is affecting actually you know, physically having a period. Does that does that change how things present, or do they not at all when it's delayed? Yeah, absolutely. So I've worked a lot in um, clinic with other doctors, menopause 
GPs that focus on menopause. Mm. So this is information I picked up a lot from them as well as reading studies. But yes, absolutely. If a woman is on an IUD, as in a coil, um, or she is on an oral contraceptive pill, her periods are not going to necessarily change. She's not going to notice that. But many of those other symptoms mm. she's going to notice. And so Okay, so she's not noticing that, but she's noticing others, and it's it's that it's very it becomes noticeable when she ref, sits down, has time to reflect mm. on what she was like, say five years prior, and where she is now, and she's going, oh, hang on a second, and yeah, 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 definitely. I think yeah. One of the biggest things that, that you say though is, is actually the recognition of it, because for sure, life is yeah. If you have kids, or, or even if you don't, life is busier more hectic uh and yeah. so yeah noticing and seeing the seeing the signs and the symptoms is sort of unpicking them from other things yeah. like you say is probably quite challenging it, so it seems to be uh the Newson health clinic or the balance actually the free balance menopause app did um some surveys and they found in fact the the psychological symptoms the mood the low mood seems to be in fact one of the biggest changes that most women notice or mood changes anyway it's very variable for everybody it might be you know it might be anxiety or, or it might be and or low mood so that's going to be noticeable but you know this comes on gradually and it takes a while for someone to reflect on it and think and they just think it's their life or something like that they don't like well partly their life but you know they don't realize it's their their hormonal changes and things can be done to sort to help absolutely yeah 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 so let's so come back to nutrition do? yeah <laughs> no, specific nutrition or ingredients uh particularly diets what what's sort of what are recommendations um yeah absolutely so let's come back to that kind of person in that time of their life they might be busy, uh, they may be cutting corners with their food, they may be buying in ready prepared meals because they haven't got much time, but they're choosing like ultra processed food or things that are perhaps not that nourishing, but they feed the family and look, every, the box is ticked and it's done. And that's quite common. And we all like that. We want, especially during the weekday, we want a quick meal and we will are prepared to cut corners and that means cutting corners on our health. And where it might not have mattered in a person's earlier years, it starts to really matter at this time. And so it's cutting corners on, are they getting enough fiber in their diet, vegetables and fruit? Are they getting enough protein in their diet what, what are the oils or fats like in their diet are they kind of more saturated fat orientated or or is there kind of like the oils that are more have more of an anti anti-inflammatory effect so that's kind of like in the macros as we call it you know looking at that in the in the, what they're eating and that's really important and it's more important than ever now we know also how that sort of style of eating like ultra processed food eating impacts our gut microbes and they impact impact our perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause experience as well they are involved in estrogen metabolism producing anti-inflammatory molecules to help support us through this time they're really really important and so are we nourishing them are we nourishing ourselves possibly not uh, so everything becomes like maybe a quick cereal in the morning with sloshed on some milk you know whatever type of milk that might be perhaps a sandwich at lunchtime maybe it's a kind of a carb heavy um, meal in the evening maybe i don't know it depends on the person ultra processed food might be a pizza uh, a bought in pizza or it might be a, like a hamburger and chips or it might even be a pasta dish where there isn't much nutritional value in it some pasta dishes can be very nutritious others can be just maybe cheese and pasta that kind of feeds the family and maybe a bit of tomato thrown in for luck yeah. yeah not not so nutritious ultra processed yeah and so i guess is it a, a lot of it's around following the mediterranean diet with you know whole grains fiber yeah yeah, um, yeah. absolutely look it's so fascinating there is and i can give you the link we can put in the show mm -hmm. notes so to speak mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh uh, there's a recent research that talks about adding fiber in to where coming back to this cardiovascular health because this is absolutely part of what we're talking about here um if you add about five grams extra of fiber a day that can lower 
for everybody, not just women in menopause. It can lower cardiovascular disease risk by 14%. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer to me. Like I was looking earlier at your field, Dr. Meals, and they all have good levels of fiber in, which I'm really pleased about, by the way. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> but it's really good. You know, if someone could get an extra five grams nudging in in the day, and they can, it's not hard to do, then that actually lowers their cardiovascular disease risk. But interesting enough, it actually helps relieve their perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause symptoms. It actually works together. So coming back to a Mediterranean style diet, that is high in fiber. It's high in the fruits and vegetables of the world. It's got that lovely plant-based focus. It's not entirely plant-based at all. You know, there's dairy and there's seafood in there and there's eggs and there's a little bit of meat and chicken and stuff, but it's mostly plant focused and it's really healthy. And people say to me, well, hang on, I don't live by the Mediterranean, Emma. How can I follow a Mediterranean diet? Well, actually, it's, it's that, those principles of that plant focus to what you're eating, the bringing in lots of fruit and veg, lots of legumes, pulses, beans, nuts and seeds, whole grains, and that sort of thing, herbs, spices. It, it's actually quite, quite doable and an olive oil. And I noticed, actually, I think, do you put olive oil in some of your dishes? I think I've yeah, seen we it. We only, use, we only use olive oil in our, in our nice. yeah you go so you know there you go. another big tick okay great um so you know i think this is extremely important for people to grasp and understand and actually what's the it's it is really not rocket science and it's following just those simple principles and nudging it in and so a person could start with an, or maybe an oat-based breakfast in the morning. I mean, I would love it for their cardiovascular health and then, which is, so oats are definitely good for cardiovascular health, but also for their menopause, perimenopause symptoms. I'd love it if they added in some nuts or seeds. That's great, any mixed nuts and seeds or something like that. But I know oats are really good. Perhaps they add some fruit, frozen fruit is great. It's great, but that's a great start, amazing. Like a dollop of, some natural yoga on top, even better. So, you know, but oats are really good. They've got great fiber in them. Then you layer it up with some nuts and seeds. It's, it's a really good start. That's fantastic. And then they can go on from there. If they are just focusing on, have I got veggies in my, my lunches and my evening meals? Have I got something that's a bit fibery or fibrous? Maybe it might be a, um, a lentil or a chickpea or you know a legume or pulse or beans or is it like a, um, a brown rice or a quinoa which is some is spelled quinoa or you know bringing in a bit more fiber mm. great is the pasta multi-grain rather or, or sorry or brown like whole grain rather than white it's it kind of bringing it in it's really it's really doable um, yeah, it's great. Like I was just thinking about how good <laughs> I, t I did tell you I might wag some kale in front of you during the live and I, here I am wagging, wagging some kale in front of you. Any green leafy vegetable is extraordinarily good for both your perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause symptoms. And it's actually really good for your cardiovascular health. So it's not just about that fiber. It's also about the veggies, especially the green ones. They're just trying to nudge them in. And, um, you know, I was banging on about it when we had our call earlier. And I was saying, remind me, do you, do you put sort of some greens in your, your meals? And you said, yep, yep, we do in, in most of them. So it's, yeah, it's really, really good. So that's and, great. Yeah. And are there any, anything that's different or specific, um, or any, you know, unique ingredients or foods that people maybe should consider, I don't know, slightly differently, because a lot of what you said is actually just eat healthily and a lot of this is just general good practice. But are there any specific things that, you know, I don't know, when, you, when you're entering perimenopause or menopause, you need to think about differently. There's, there's soy is one of the questions that I think, you know, is, could be, creates a lot of debate, I guess. Yeah. Um, but then things like, I guess, fermented foods and other areas like that, that sort of, do they have yeah. a more of a prominence or they just what everyone should be doing anyway? 
No, this is exactly it. They do have more of a prominence. Absolutely. So when we begin to lose our female reproductive hormones, our inflammation goes up because estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, which we, we have all three of them in our body, in our female bodies, they are anti-inflammatory. So sure, they're there for reproductive purposes, but actually they have a beneficial effect in all throughout our body, especially we know estrogen, there are estrogen receptors in the brain, in our joints, you know, throughout the body, in our gut. So it's very important to replace with our food and with anti-inflammatory ingredients, really support that inflammatory state because that's going to affect our mood and our quality of our sleep as much as it's going to affect kind of like our physical sensations as well. And so this is really important. You're, you're absolutely right. And actually anti-inflammatory eating is incredibly good for our cardiovascular health as well. So anti-inflammatory eating, coming back to what I just said, is a Mediterranean style diet focus, but specifically when we're talking about that kind of perimenopause and menopause, also foods rich in phytoestrogens are anti-inflammatory. They're good for cardiovascular health. They are great for the perimenopause and menopause and soy being one of the foods that are highest in those phytoestrogens and they are 100% fabulous. There's nothing negative about soy, maybe possibly about their manufacture, not manufacture, their growing process with mm -hmm. the glyphosphates they're sprayed with. That's a person's choice whether they want to buy organic or not. But beyond that, soy foods are fabulous. They're really, really good. And the phytoestrogens eaten in food are absolutely brilliant. They're quite safe and they are really great for us our, all our health, our cardiovascular health, our perimenopause and menopause health, our gut health, our guts, our gut microbes love soy foods as well. So soy is found in soy beans and therefore we might eat them as tofu. Fantastic, firm tofu, really good protein source, great for us, us. Great source of phytoestrogens, it's really good. But in fact, there are phytoestrogens in um, chickpeas, for example, and there are phyto, so they're in actually in all legumes, pulses and beans, but they're highest in things like chickpeas. They're in nuts and seeds. And let me wag some almonds in front of you instead of kale, although you can't really see it because I'll drop them. But I've got some almonds here um, in my hand. And that, that humble nut has phytoestrogens in it and fiber and protein and anti-inflammatory oils. So it's really good. So yes, seeking out phytoestrogen rich foods is actually hugely beneficial and it does work it does subtly make a beneficial difference you know if someone is actually you know if someone has symptoms that it's they it's properly disturbing their quality of life they absolutely need to go to their gp and tell them that and tell them that these perimenopause symptoms are disturbing my quality of life because hrt is just a fabulous natural drug it's it's brilliant however it doesn't mean they don't absolutely focus on eating well and that is symptom relieving as well Brilliant. yeah and lots of people um who i think will you know follow field doctor might well be following a, a you know specific diet be that gluten-free be that uh, maybe just um vegan or vegetarian or uh low fodmap or others and are there any do they should people think about doing things differently or as is it actually doing exactly the same thing just managing it within you know the parameters of, of your diet yeah um i think well you see i think if someone's following a vegan diet a vegetarian diet a low fodmap diet and i can explain what that is in a minute or um and also a gluten-free diet they can a hundred percent be following the mediterranean diet principles they can 100 percent be looking after their health they can get plenty of protein and fiber in it's just about knowing and i know your meals for instance you always make sure there's plenty of protein in there there's a good amount of fiber there's uh, you know you some veggies in there and so so you've done the work for people fantastic but from my perspective all the meals that i have like the recipes on my website that's also the same i've made sure there's plenty of protein and things like that in there but yeah, they can. They can. You know, if someone is gluten free, that's they're only they're only having to avoid three, four grains. When I say three, four, they have to avoid wheat and the sister of wheat is spelt. That's got gluten in it. There's rye and then there's barley because oats are actually naturally gluten free. Although if someone is celiac, they need to have it labeled as gluten free, obviously. Yeah. But 
there's loads of other grain to be on that. It's fantastic. You know, it's not restrictive at all. And so, you know, they can easily manage that. And that's, that's fantastic. If someone is FODMAPs, that just means avoiding certain types of fermentable foods that can, in some people, cause worsening like gut bloating or IBS star symptoms. And perhaps their healthcare pr practitioner said, well, go on this low FODMAP diet, try it to see if it reduces your symptoms. It's not a diet you stay on for life because you reintroduce food back in. And that's why it has to be led by a healthcare, a qualified healthcare practitioner, but it is for IBS. Um, but within that, there is plenty. There is absolutely plenty of variability, lots of this Mediterranean style eating. So it's, it's not restrictive and the same with vegan and vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Absolutely. Yeah. One um, one question around, I guess, particularly cardiovascular, but also in in menopause, is this uh, is the idea of sort of weight management, and it's and it's one of I I wait all the messages to me to mention even mentioning it, but it's something that I've certainly read about that is you know is a focus in I guess in the population in general that we should be look, thinking more about it. But is it does it become more relevant in menopause? Yeah, no, actually it does. It's very, very much more relevant to menopause because there's lots of female hormones actually lead to more insulin sensitivity. And what do I mean by that? It means that pre-perimenopause, uh, a woman might eat the exact same amount of calories, same food, and she won't, might not put on weight. Uh, and then in perimenopause and beyond, that same food might mean she has a bit more of abdominal fat gain because that sensitivity in her blood to the, the let's call it sugar that goes in the blood from meals is, is the sensitivity for using it in our body is slightly reduced. And that's what I mean by that. And so the likelihood for it to go then to abdominal fat gain is, in, is more likely. So this is really important because we actually statistically know that a woman does put on weight in the perimenopause and beyond. And so it does become really important that she's very aware of this and, and, and just adjusts a little bit what she's eating. And I think that's really important, whether it be she looks at literally quantities, food quantities, and perhaps reduces down maybe her evening meal, just looks at the size of it, or, or whether she looks at what is that food that meal made up of the, the, the carbohydrate content, the fat content, you know, and that she just has a look at it and just sort of tweaks it a bit. That is often what all it takes and tweaking and swaps. And I know that actually where field doctor is really handy because of course you've done the tweaking for a person. It's, it's a, it's a complete meal. It's been enhanced. You'd like it's, you've got your fiber, you've got your protein in, you've done the ticks for boxes. So it's really good. I had a client recently I saw for a view consult in clinic and she was trying to lose weight. That wasn't the purpose of our uh, initial consult, but she was also trying to lose weight and she was struggling a bit. And um, I was talking about some swaps with her and she was gradually changing them, which was great. But also she was quite tired sometimes and needed some ready prepared meals. And I really wanted her to get some healthy ones. So I suggested field doctor to her and she ate, you know, a few times and loved it. And actually, I think she's reordered from me, which is great. But this is the key thing. She said to me in the review consult, I didn't realize how big or literally how large my evening meal plate was, you know, my food on my evening meal plate until I ate the field doctor meals. And I felt satisfied, she said to me, from the field doctor meals. And I wasn't hungry in the evening, but it was a smaller size than, than what she had loaded into her plate before. And it was just that. It was just it was just knowing that for her um and she started to lose weight so yeah i think that's one of the really hard things like we talk to our customers uh, you know quite a lot and one of the really big things people talk about is just just suffering from tiredness and fatigue and, and oh. actually like, and it, it's so hard to not reach to the cupboard and i'm sitting in my kitchen right now and and i normally work um down my garden in my shed because actually it removes me from where the temptation is and it's so hard when you suddenly like, i'm tired right rather than going actually you know there's other in, other things i could do like get some fresh air or you know uh yeah. go to sleep probably earlier but it's really easy for us to just grab a grab something that um that's it isn't good for us and, and making a different choice yeah that's um, it Alex.
Six, that's exactly it. There you go. That's just what we're talking about. That's it. Yeah. Perfect. You can come do my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you. I'll let you do that. I think you're much better. Um, <laughs> are there any top tips? You talked about um, increasing fiber content by five grams. Um, is there a way that people can think about that? What does that look like in practice? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's literally about, say, if you're actually preparing your own food, it's about uh, bringing it. So say you've got an evening meal, you've got some veggies there, you've got some protein, you've got some carbs. But perhaps you could think about what the carbs are. Uh, maybe if they were chips or mashed potato or something, could you swap them out? Could it be a whole grain pasta? Could it be some, like some cooked quinoa or something like that? Could it be if you've opened a can of lentils and just literally put a tablespoon mixed into the veggies or something like that? Just bring in some, some more gently fiber rich foods, that sort of thing. Uh, it's about um, snacking on things like, I could bring up my arms again to my, onto my hand, but it's about snacking on, you know, this, this little baby here, this, this kind of whole almond, you know, I've chosen to buy what they call raw almonds. And that one's got that brown coating on it, which is shock a bot full of fiber. The almond itself has some fiber in it. But could you have perhaps snack on um, a few like eight or 10 raw almonds a day? That's got fiber in it. That's fantastic. And maybe instead of a cake or a biscuit made from white flour, which has no fiber in it, that sort of thing. That's really, really good. Just bringing those in. I, I think it's and then then a person's done it. They, they really have. It's great. Chickpeas, lentils, they're just fabulous. You don't need a lot of it. You don't need to bloat your stomach. You don't need to get all kind of, you know, windy. Um, it's just a little bit is great. It's really, really good. Yeah, it's fantastic. And any other, and, yeah. Any, yeah, go on. Go on. I was going to yeah, say any right. other top tips. And, and, and also just, I guess, put sort of how, how any places to send people to in terms of where to look for advice or, um, I don't know, just to, read more find out more about i guess menopause or or that and cardiovascular disease and, and how you know, yeah, to, uh, yeah. no but this is the thing isn't it it's where to go for the information well funny enough the nhs has actually got quite a lot of good information about this uh, people just sort of i don't know why maybe they dismiss the nhs but it actually got some really good information about cardiovascular health and in fact about menopause but i also like the free balance menopause app for facts about menopause. Mm. Uh, there is some really good information, for instance, on a, a um, website called Health in Menopause. That's really good as well. There's other areas called um, the, uh, like there's the menopause charity. There's other things like that. Of course, there's my social media and my website as well. And that's, I try and put these, these facts out there as well. Yeah, definitely there is. Um, have a look around and get to a feel for this information and not forgetting of course where's your fat source come from we talked about olive oil earlier but I hadn't talked about seafood and seafood is very cardiovascular protective if someone eats seafood including obviously oily fish being the best but so are nuts and seeds as well so that's really good yeah any uh parting words of wisdom obviously your email your website is emmasnutrition.com if people want to go and check it out um so, thank uh, you <laughs> any other any other yeah any other parting words of wisdom uh or yeah or, uh, it doesn't take a radical change people don't have to absolutely overhaul their diet at all it takes a few swaps it re it really does that's all it takes and if someone wants to lose a bit of that belly fat maybe they just slightly reduce down that overall food they're eating a little bit and see how that goes so a few healthy swaps in and reducing down a little bit of what they're eating overall uh, that might be literally all it takes so it's so it's really it's really good it's really doable brilliant yeah thanks emma and next yeah. whoever i uh, speak to next i'm gonna have to say they have to bring some props yeah um, absolutely as you've got to wag some kale <laughs> or something like that what else did i have in case i needed it or oh, other nuts and seeds and yeah <laughs> props are good <laughs> brilliant well, thanks, Emma, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, this will, yeah, we'll post this on our on our uh, on our site, and we'll put some of the links in uh, in, the, in the notes Amazing. as well. But brilliant, so love to see you, and thanks very much, Emma. Okay, brilliant. Bye then. Take care. Bye. bye.